Good. All right. Good morning. We are we're awake, ready to go. Welcome to Cascadia Church. Good to have you this morning. We've checked in. We've prayed. We're ready to go like we customarily do. So I'm going to have you, if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. And uh, to some people, the book of Revelation is just one big mystery. And uh, sometimes people read through the book or they think about Revelation and it can be somewhat frightening perhaps or confusing. Uh, We know for sure that the book of Revelation is very unique. There's no other book quite like it in the scriptures. And because of its unique nature, people read it or interpret it in a variety of different ways. Uh, Many people will interpret the book either symbolically or literally. And out of those two camps, some who will interpret the book symbolically will say that none of the events in the book of Revelation have happened yet. Others who will interpret symbolically say everything in the book of Revelation has already happened. And those who read Revelation literally will say, well, none of the events have happened yet. Others who read it literally will say all of the events have happened yet. And still there's another camp that will interpret it symbolically and literally and say some of events have happened and some of those prophecies have not yet happened. So there's just a wide variety of the ways that people read the book of Revelation. And we're not going to dive into all of that right now. What we're going to do instead is look at one question in the book of Revelation. There are several, but we're going to look at one. And we're just going to explore it at face value. And we're going to take a look at what's the question being asked? Why is the question being asked? How is the question answered? And then what difference does the answer make to you and me today? This is kind of the template of the pattern that we've been using through this entire series on questions that Jesus answered. And so uh, here is the question. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So no matter how you interpret the book of Revelation, how you view it or how you understand it, one thing that every reader of the book of Revelation agrees on is that the book is is loaded with judgment. Judgment from God against those who have rejected or denied his son Jesus. And there is lots of judgment from God against those who mistreat God's people. That's what this question is about. God, how long are you going to let these people continue to mistreat your people? And when are you going to bring justice? It's a question about delayed justice. And the answer is both comforting and frustrating. We'll see that in just a few moments as we, as we continue on. So in the book of Revelation, as I said, there are a series of judgments. And those judgments are symbolized by a number of images. One, the first series of judgments are what we call the seal judgments, not the little critter that swims in the water, but a piece of wax pressed onto a scroll to bind or to hold something closed or locked until it is opened by a reader. So prior to the printing of books, Anything that was written was written either on uh, parchment, which is like animal skin leather, or papyrus, which are reeds pressed together to form very crude paper. And then these documents would be rolled up. Then a piece of wax was pressed where the page comes to the end there and sealed so that whoever this message is intended for would know that nobody has tampered with the message. So in the book of Revelation, there is a scroll that has seven seals on it. Those are the first seven judgments. Then there are what we call the trumpet judgments. Now, back in Bible times, they didn't have like a brass trumpet with valves and and those kinds of things. They blew a ram's horn or a shofar. But in our language, our vocabulary, we use the word trumpet. So there are a series of trumpet blasts to announce more judgment 
from God on those who have rejected his son and those who are abusing God's people. And then there are a series of bowl judgments. And the bowls symbolize that God's wrath is being poured out on the people that are living on the earth and even on the planet itself. So here's how these judgments work. There are the seven seals that are opened and with the opening of each seal, new information is revealed showing the kinds of judgment that is to come. And Jesus is the only one who is qualified to break open these seals, which means he has full authority and full control over what is happening with these judgments. He decides when the judgment happens, who is going to be judged, how severe the judgment will be, how long the judgment will last, and when the judgment is over, and when the next level of judgment begins. Jesus makes those decisions. And so the seventh seal that is broken is actually the beginning of a new series of judgments that we call the trumpet judgments. And on the seventh blast of that shofar or that trumpet or that horn, <coughs> introduce a series of bowl judgments where things really get intense and God's judgment is poured out. Today we're looking at the fifth seal judgment. That's how it fits in the context of what's happening in the book of Revelation. And <clears throat> this question that we're going to look at has to do with uncertainty about delayed judgment. God, we see the judgment has begun. You're exercising your authority. You're punishing wrongdoers. And we need to know, God, how long are you going to let those who are abusing your people, your children, how long are you going to let them get away with this? That's the question they're asking. Why do you allow people to continue to abuse your followers? How long are you going to let them get away with that? Uh, and I thought about that question this week, and I wondered how many, don't show your hands, but how many in this room have asked similar questions to God? God, do you see what's happening? <laughs> how long are you going to let people abuse your children? How long are you going to let the, 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 the trouble go on? How long are you going to let them continue God, there's, do you see what I'm going through? Do you see what my neighbor is going through? Do you see what my children are going through? How long, God, are you going to let this go on? When are you going to stop it? I've asked those questions, and sometimes I still do. How long, God, are you going to let this go on without you intervening and stopping the abuse? The, the, the way that God's people are being treated how long, God, do we have to wait for your justice? And we're going to look at the answer to, those, uh, to that, that big question. It's still being asked in different ways today, but it's a big question in the book of Revelation. So let's get into this, Revelation chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 9. And here's the first idea we want to look at is this. Sometimes God's people are abused. Sometimes God's people are abused. Verse 9, when the Lamb, Jesus, broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Now remember, John is looking into heaven. He has this vision of heaven, and he's, he's taking this kind of a spiritual tour, so to speak, and he notices that there is an altar it's a place of worship. And he sees under this altar the souls of those who had been, literally the word is slaughtered. Followers of Christ. The Lamb, of course, is Jesus, as I said just a moment ago. He sees the souls, the lives of these faithful who were put to death, they were slaughtered for two reasons. Number one, because of the word of God, because of the scriptures, their, uh, their allegiance to the truth of God's word. And number two, for their testimony, because of their faithfulness to the word of God. 
That's the only reason these people were killed. It's because they love Jesus. And they're following his leadership. And they want to be obedient to him. And so these people, as I said a moment ago, it says here in this verse that they had been killed, but the word is also translated slaughtered. It is the same word used regarding a sacrificial lamb. When a sacrifice was given to God in the Old Testament, they would slit the throat and drain the blood at the foot of the altar. And that's the image that John is bringing to our minds as we're reading these words. And Jesus knows what this is like. He was the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. He bled out on the cross. It was a bloody death. And so it was as well for these people. John sees them under the altar, and it moves him. It moves him. Here's uh, a verse. Take a look at this. This is in reference to Jesus. Found in the Revelation, book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slaughtered. Now it's kind of interesting that you've got this image of someone who has been slaughtered but standing. So the, the imagery here that John is giving us is that Jesus Christ was slaughtered, yes, but he's living. He's risen from the dead. That's right at the very beginning of Revelation. Jesus said, I was, I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. We read the same thing in Revelation 5.8, 5.12, 13.8. This imagery often of Jesus Christ, the land that was slaughtered, and it was a brutal, violent death, and these people that John sees uh, died a brutal, violent death as well. And so this same word, slaughtered, is used of these faithful in Revelation chapter 6. A little bit later in the book of Revelation, John gets, little, gets more graphic about how these people were slaughtered. We read in Revelation 20 verse 4, I saw the souls of those who had been, see the word, beheaded. Beheaded. Because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. We see these words repeated from, verse, from chapter 6, verse 9. They come up again in chapter 20, verse 4. And I believe he's referring to the same people. That they are victorious, they have been rewarded, and they are living and alive and well, although their death was violent and brutal. Beheaded. There's a, there's a clue here. Um, if if this, the book of Revelation is to be interpreted literally, uh, yet to be fulfilled, uh, it, it uh, prophesies that there will someday be a one world religion, a one world government. Antichrist, the false prophet, the beast, and so forth. And many have speculated what is the coming one world religion. Uh, some, although I don't think it's much of a popular idea today, say that it is a particular Christian denomination. They'll tell you that it's Roman Catholicism. I strongly disagree with that. Strongly disagree. Because a Catholic will not behead you if you don't convert. Muslims will. They do it today. And I think they're going to do it in the future. I think the coming world religion is Islam. And, and their goal is to dominate and take over. And uh, they are on their way. Uh, Christianity is still the fastest growing religion by conversion. But Islam is the fastest growing religion by procreation, by having lots and lots of babies. And so Islam in that way is the fastest growing religion. But uh, it is a violent religion. And uh, those in some parts of the world who are pressured to convert and they don't today are beheaded. And so Revelation speaks of the same kind of experience, I think. And so uh, the idea here is that these people of whom John is speaking have received the worst kind of abuse. Terrifying. 
And so <laughs> it makes any other kind of ill treatment that you or I might receive seem to be rather insignificant. It's still painful. It's still unwanted. It's still not what we prefer. It's still not right. So the question then for us, not only for these faithful reading about a revelation, but for those of us as well, what do we do when we're being mistreated? Even by other Christians. What do we do? Just simply because we love Jesus and we want to serve him. And the answer is the same that was found for these people here is remain faithful to the end. Don't quit. Don't capitulate. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Don't quit. Stay faithful to the end. Number two is this. Always God's people can ask for justice. Always God's people can ask for justice. Grammatically, it's not real good, but for the outline, it works pretty well. So you, you get to deal with that. Verse 10. Uh, they cried out with a loud voice. These are the ones who had been slaughtered. Violent, brutal, bloody death. Saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who live on the earth? That's the question of the day. And the ones that are crying out are the ones that, are, that were killed. And notice they're alive. I often say, I said it twice this week, uh, at funeral services that I do, that this is not the end. There is life beyond this life. There is life eternal. And it's spent either in heaven with Christ or apart from him eternally. So here's another indication here that even though you die physically, you remain alive eternally. And so what I think is fascinating, if you look at this, and we're going to talk about this point right here a little bit more in Flock Talk after the message, that those who are alive in heaven in this vision that John sees, they are aware of what's happening on earth. They know what's happening to other people on earth. I think that they are also aware of how they died because they're asking for God to avenge their blood because others are being slaughtered implied in the same way that we were and I, I thought that was kind of fascinating and I wondered this week as I was putting this together when we get to heaven are we going to remember how we died was it quiet and peacefully in our sleep was it an automobile accident was it something violent well, I, I don't know we'll find out when we get there but at least for these, it appears that these people knew how they died and why they died. And they're asking for some relief for their brothers and sisters here on earth. <clears throat> Looking at some of these words here, avenging the blood. Uh, in the Old Tas Testament scriptures, as I said earlier this morning, that when an animal was sacrificed, the blood was poured out at the altar. Uh, we have here with us this morning my cousin Joe and his uh, oldest brother, Mikey, who's six months older than me. He's in heaven now. Uh, Mikey and I uh, went to Israel together. It was my first trip to the Holy Land with Mikey. We had a wonderful time. We were up on Mount Carmel where Elijah had the showdown with the prophets of Baal or Baal. And as we were coming down, there was a man who was sacrificing a lamb. He was making an animal sacrifice to God. And we saw that lamb tethered, tied, and the man pulled back the neck of this, the head of this animal and slit the throat. And we watched that animal struggle and die and bleed out. There was a lot of blood. It was emotional to watch this animal struggle and to think about Jesus how he laid down his life for us as the Lamb of God. I thought about that moment again today or this week as I was reading about these saints whose death was bloody. And they're saying, God, avenge our blood. Make this right. Do you see? Do you know what they've done? Of course God knows what they've done. And the question is, 
when are you going to do something about it? And they're saying this respectfully, but they're asking for justice. And it's never wrong to ask for God to right a wrong. It's never wrong to ask for God to bring justice. God is a God of justice. Justice is not revenge. Justice is the proper use of power and the proper use of authority. And they're not asking for God to punish these people beyond what they deserve. They're just saying, God, would you do the right thing? You can read these kinds of prayers in, in the Psalms. Some of the Psalms in the Old Testament are what we call imprecatory Psalms. And the Lloyd prayer phrase of an imprecatory Psalm is, Lord God, do something. God, do you see what they're doing? Take them out. Deal with them. In fact, as David, King David prayed some of his imprecatory Psalms, he says, God, kill them. And God answered some of those prayers. Now, I would not encourage you to, to pray for God to kill anybody, but it's never wrong to ask God to bring justice, to do the right thing, to give people what they deserve. However, here's or what they've earned. Here's a really super important point. Uh, and I'll show you a verse in just a moment. Never are we to take matters into our own hands. Never. Never are we to try to right a wrong, even when we know that if we, if we do something, we can fix this. If we do something, we can win. Uh, it, it is, listen, it is never our place to fight back. Never. Uh, it is never our place to try to get even or ahead or try to teach our abusers a lesson. Now, if somebody's breaking the law, call the police. I don't have any problem with that. But if they're not breaking the law and they're just being mean, let it go. Let it go. Here's what the scripture says. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. See this word? Never. You know what it means? The literal translation of that word? I looked it up in the original language. You know what it means? Never. That's what it means. It's no secret. Never do it. And I know, and some of you know as well, how tempting it is to pursue, listen carefully, how tempting it is to pursue the satisfaction of shutting down somebody who harmed you. That is so tempting. That is so tempting. It's so tempting to pursue the satisfaction of shutting down someone who betrayed you or someone who maligned you. Let me tell you this. <laughs> Listen carefully. There's nothing that compares to the satisfaction of watching God do that for you. I've seen that in the past. It is amazing. It is amazing. Very satisfactory, very satisfying. Uh, if you remember, take a look at Psalm 37. And then take a look at Psalm 73. Take those two, two digits, three and seven. Read it, flip it, read seven, three. Both those Psalms are all about God. Why do you let the wicked get away with what they're doing? When is this going to stop? And the promises that are in those Psalms are amazing. So I'm just going to turn you to the Word of God and let you read it for yourself. Final thought number three, never will God act unjustly. Never. Never. 11, verse 11. And a white robe was given to each of them who? The ones that were butchered. And they were told that they were to rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed, even as they had been, was completed also. This is the answer to the question. God, when are you going to fix this? You know what his answer is? As soon as more people are treated the same way that you've been treated. That is so frustrating. You know what? We wanted this solved yesterday. And 
God is saying there will not be justice until others are slaughtered in the same way that you were slaughtered. There is more to come. But don't miss this part of the answer as well. It's in the first part. Where the white robe is given, that's a picture, a symbol of purity, of righteousness, of the difference that Christ makes in a person's life. That's the imagery or the symbolism behind this white robe given to these people. So it's, God is not only saying that justice will come after more have been slaughtered, but as you're waiting, I, I want you to know that I, I care about you. Then I want you to be re rewarded, and I want to affirm my love for you. And so that's, uh, in a little a couple of minutes, we're going to sing Good, Good Father. And I, I told Ashley this morning that again, uh, she's, the Spirit of God has led her to choose these songs we're singing today because they fit in so well with what we're looking at today. So, you know, I, I thought about the, this whole scene in heaven that's happening here. Uh, it, it must have been very difficult for them. When, when they had been damaged so deeply on earth, um, to hear God say that uh, there are others who are going to be damaged in the same way. And then at some point, I'll say enough, but not now. Not now. And so we need to remember that God is sovereign, which means that he's in charge. He's fully aware of what's happening. He knows why things are happening. He knows what he's doing. He doesn't make mistakes. He's never early. He's never delayed. He never does anything halfway. He never goes, oh, you know, I should have thought about that. Thanks for bringing that up because it wouldn't have crossed my mind. No, God knows everything there is to know. And he always makes the right choice every single time. He always does the right thing. He never acts unjustly. Never. Never. He always does the right thing at the right time. Which means this, according to what we're looking at here in this question. Sometimes justice means um, God's just going to let it ride for a while. And we just wait. That's the hardest part just have to wait. That's when we're tempted to say, okay, if God's not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And that is when trouble comes. And we just stay away from that. We just can't go there. So as we're waiting, he wants us to know as well that he hasn't forgotten about us. He hasn't given up on us. He's always going to do the right thing. He never acts unjustly. And there will come a day and it's promised in scriptures, where the blood of these martyrs will be avenged. And we read about that in Revelation chapter 19, verse 2. His judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality. See this? And he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. There's a day of justice coming where God will not only make everything right, he's not going to just balance the scales, he is going to tip them in our favor because he loves us. And he's generous, and he's gracious, and he's good. There will come a day when he will wipe away every tear and he will make everything right. And, and maybe you're like me, I wish that was yesterday. But uh, maybe today. We just don't know. Until then, what we do is we continue to trust God as we wait for justice. I will trust God as I wait for justice, knowing that he is God and I am not. He is in control and I am not. He'll do the right thing. I probably won't. So it's best that I just wait and be satisfied with watching God act on my behalf and do what he believes is the right thing to do at the right time, in the right way. Next week, we're going to do an extended communion service. We're between series. We finished up our series on questions Jesus answered. Next week, we're going to share the bread and the cup for Sunday of the month. 
And we're going to focus on this verse here. Greater love has no one than this, than a person will lay down his life for his friends. So that will be the theme of where we're going next week. For now, we're going to say goodbye to those that are watching. So let's say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Okay. And we're going to sing for a little bit.